Okay, so this is going to be a talk about the theoretical foundations of machine learning. And I have no clue what is the level of the people here, and I guess it's very heterogeneous. So please, feel to interrupt me and ask questions. And I mean, that's why it's a, it's a summer school. It's not a, a lecture, so you can interact. We have three lectures, we have time, and please uh, let me know if I'm going to so fast or getting cold. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is to warn you. So this is not about how cool machine learning is. So, I mean, I, I'm sure you're already convinced of that, and I'm not going to try to convince you how nice it is. Also, I'm not going to show you any videos of amazing applications. Uh, for that, you will have the, the rest of the week, and uh, there will be a lot of uh, uh, great applications uh, by applications. What I want to do is to talk about understanding the principles that underlying machine learning. So it's about the principles and not about the applications. It's about static, not about the how to program or how to make money out of machine. Okay, so I, I like to start my talks with this citation from Herbert Simon. So Herbert Simon was a, a well-known economist and he got the Nobel Prize in Economy. And he said that the purpose of science is to find meaningful simplicity in the midst of disorderly complexity. And I, I like it very much, and I think it could also serve as the definition of what are we trying to do with machine learning. We have tons of data, and the data is very complex, and uh, we are just swamped by data. And what we are trying to do is to find some meaningful simplicity, some patterns that are both meaningful and uh, simple, understandable, comprehensible, that will make sense out of the huge data. So this could also be uh, viewed as a definition of what are we trying to do in statistical machine. Okay, so more concretely what we're trying to do is we look algorithm, we look at algorithms that will try to detect meaningful regularities in very large complex data. So you have a very large complex data set, so you have the records of patients that were collected over you know, 10,000 patients over 15 years. Every year you, you interview all your patients and do a test to them and you get tons of data. Now you're trying to find some kind of meaningful uh, pattern. So very simple patterns could be found by human perception. The doctor can notice that there is a correlation between people having cancer and people smoking. But if the connections are more complex and just one variable implies another variable, then human perception is too weak to detect it. And what we are hoping is that machine learning, statistical machine learning algorithms will allow us to pick such meaningful parts. So we focus on data that's too complex for humans to figure out the meaningful regularities. And we consider finding those regularities from random samples. So a lot of machine learning is based on the assumption that what we have, data that we have, is not full data of the universe, but it's just a sample from some bigger a corpus of data. Okay, so a typical setting, I mean, I mean this is an example which probably you all know, so I'll go over it very, very quickly. So say you want to develop a spam filter. Uh, so you want a program that will help you to determine what is spam and what is not. So what you do is you first represent its matches by features. So the first step is to take your data and extract features out of your data. If messages may be your important features are the return address, keywords, spelling, etc. So now you translate every email into a vector of features, and now you take a training sample. So what's a training sample? A training sample is a sub collection of emails on which someone did the work for us and marked for us whether they're spam or not. And based on this sample, the goal is to produce a good predictor, a good algorithm that for future emails will detect whether they're spam or not. So basically, it looks like this. You have every email is a row here, and it has a, it's, a, it's a vector of the different features that you uh, collected, that you decide, decided that they are relevant. And this is a training sample. So someone marks for us what is common and what is not. So we take this data set, which is a labeled collection of feature vectors. We feed it into our algorithm, and we want our algorithm to spit out another algorithm. What it should spit out is the algorithm that's going to be the spam field. So it should spit out some rules, 
in saying something like predict spam if the sender is unknown and you have inside the email the word sex or the word sales or whatever. Okay, so basically the, the pattern here is that we have this training sample, we extracted features, and based on this, we're trying to come up with the output, which is a program that will do classification for us. So this is not all of machine learning, but it's a big chunk of machine learning, which is called classification prediction. We're trying to come up with a algorithms that gives us a prediction of a class, spam or not spam, uh, sick or healthy, and so on. So here are some examples of a classification prediction tasks. There are many of them. Say medical diagnosis, you have a patient, you want to know if the patient is high or low risk. It would be great if you could have a program that will help us determine that. Or we have a proteins and we want to classify them into the function of this protein. Or we have a, a, some credit card transactions and we want to classify them into which transactions were legal and which transactions were fraudulent. Or we have a stock market and we want to know if tomorrow this uh, stock is going to go up or down. So what I'm saying is that we have many tasks that have this flavor that what you want to predict, algorithm that you're designing, just needs to predict a class, yes or no. This is in itself, it's a sub area, but it's an important sub area, there's a lot of application. So let's go into this uh, direction. We're going to do, to talk about uh, finding uh, classifi classification predictions based on training data. So now I'm getting into a little bit of formalism. So what will be my formalism? So we have a domain set. So the domain set is going to be not emails, but the vectors of features that you attract, extract from them. So the domain set is going to be a more well-defined mathematical object. It's not patient, but it's the vector of tests that we feed to the program. And then we have a label set, and in our case, if we just uh, two classes, then we can assume that it's zero and one, either sick or not sick, either fraudulent or legal transaction, and so on. So it's either zero or one. Now we assume the very simple setup in which we get a training set. So a training data is a sequence of uh, points and, let's see, this, what? Okay, so it's the sequence of instances and the labels, and this is what we get as a training. And what the algorithm, the learner has to output is a function that we, on every point on X, will predict the label. So that's the basic setting that we want to intend. Okay, so in order to have some notion of success, we have to define what is our goal and how is the data generated. So it's just to predict the label without any assumption on how the data was generated is impossible. So what we're going to assume is that there is some unknown distribution that generates the instances independently of each other. So this is already a very strong assumption, but it applies to many uh, situations. So we assume that the instances that we see, the emails that we see, are independent of each other. There's some unknown distribution that generates emails or generates transaction credit cards. And each example that we see is a fresh draw from this distribution that is independent of what happened before. And there is some known prediction rule that tells us for every transaction, whether it's fraudulent or legal, and we don't know this rule. So this rule is unknown. And now we are trying to come up with some predictor H, and now we have to define how do we measure the success of our H. So if we assume that there is some unknown distribution that generates data in the universe, then it is very natural to decide that what we are trying to optimize is to minimize the probability that when X is sampled from this unknown uh, distribution of nature, we want to minimize the probability that our prediction H of X is different than the true label F of X. So in the first vanilla setup, we assume that there is an unknown distribution that generates data. There is an unknown function that labels this data as zero or one. And we are trying, based on our sample, we are trying to come up with some hypothesis H that's trying to minimize the probability that there will be an X on which we will misprediction. 
so far make sense? Okay, so we'll start with this very simple scenario and then we'll talk about a little bit more complex scenario. So what can we say about this simple uh, setup? So it's a, a very natural tool to use in this situation. So you get this training sample, you get a sequence of points and the labels, and you're trying to come up with a rule that will predict for future access whether they're labeled zero or one. So one of the natural, maybe the most natural thing to do is to define the notion of an empirical error of an H. So if I have any hypothesis, I can look at the sample here. This is all that I know about the universe. And I can count how many times over this sample, how many times my H mispredicts the label Y. So this F of XI is the label YI. So I can just count how many times am I making mistakes over this training sample. And uh, so this is called the empirical uh, loss. And the first rule that we are uh, most natural to use is called ERM, which is, um, stands for empirical risk minimization. And it says, find an H that will minimize this loss over the sample. So that's the very simplest rule. Find an H, all you have is the sample. Find some hypothesis that over the sample behaves nicely. So that's the very first rule to try. And if that was all, then we would not have the whole industry of machine learning. So some, something can go wrong here. What can go wrong with such a rule? So consider the following situation. I can kind of cheat. I can say, OK, I have this training sample. And here is my, my rule that I'm using, h of x. h of x will be yi if x is one of the points that appeared in the sample. Then I will just copy the label that I saw in the sample. And for any x that I didn't see in the sample, I'll predict zero. So here is a very good spam detector. On any email for which you gave it the label, whether it was spam or not, it will just spit back what you gave it. And on every new email, it will say it's spam. Now, clearly, this predictor has zero empirical error. On the sample that we trained on, our predictor is doing a perfect job. But still, there are many situations in which we will not be happy with this predictor. We will, it's pretty obvious that in many cases, such an X will have high error. So just to minimize the error over the sample is not sufficient. Something is missing. But on the other hand, all we have is just our sample. So what else can we do? So the next step is to introduce, we need some prior knowledge. So this will be one of the most important kind of high level messages that I want to convey in these, these talks. You cannot do machine learning without implementing prior knowledge. There's gonna be no universal intelligence. There's gonna be no singularity. You cannot, we can prove it. You cannot do anything without prior knowledge. You need prior knowledge. So let, let's see an example of why you need prior knowledge, and this is not mathematical. Example. So one of the examples I, I, I really like to, to, to start with is a phenomenon which is called bait shyness in rats. So I don't know how many of you are farmers or trying to fight rats, but farmers that are, try, that are really suffering from rats, one of the natural things to do is to distribute around bait with poisonous bait. If the rat will eat the poison, we may get rid of them. It turns out that the rats are smarter than they. If the rat sees some kind of food that it's not used to, that looks or smells or tastes a little bit different than what it's used to, it will, on the first tasting, it will only taste a very little bit of this food. And then it will just be, ignore it for the rest of the day. If a few, after a few hours the rat feels sick, it will associate the sickness with this new food that it tasted and never touch it again. So if you're trying to just poison rats with bait, it's not going to work. They are very smart. They will try it a little bit. And, and the amazing phenomena here is that at the end of the day, they've done a lot of things during the day. They walked around, they made friends, they ate this, they ate that. And at the end of the day, they feel sick. They associate it with, with the new food they were just tried and will never touch it again. So if you're worried about killing, killing rats, there is a solution. 
<laughs> it doesn't have to do anything with machine learning. The solution is to have poison that has a delay. So they, they come to the end of the day, the poison is still delayed, they feel fine. The next day they come to the date and say, this is great, I mean, I, I felt great last night. They eat it again, they eat it again. And after a week, suddenly, boom, it kicks in and it's too late to regret. But that's not the part that we care about in the machine learning. <laughs> So this is very successful learning. This is learning from just one small experiment, one example. Suffices for the rest to learn what is, uh, this is called bait shyness. It has nothing to do with my name. And uh, this is the description of bait shyness, very successful learning. But if you think that animals are very smart, here is an example of stupid animals. So <laughs> this is called pigeon superstition. And this is an experiment that was done by Skinner. Skinner was a famous psychologist, and he, he was one of the fathers of behavior. And behaviorism was trying to do a, a, you know, a counterattack on Freud. Freud was saying, you know, all your troubles have to do with how your parents treated you when you were a small child, and all your dilemmas just have to do with sex. And they didn't like it. So they say, no, 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 there is no difference between humans and animals. Everything that you see in humans, we can also show in animals we should treat the organism as a black box. There is an input, there is an output. Let's try to learn this function from input to output. And they were trying to replicate in animals behaviors that we know from humans. And this is a very nice experiment in which he could get the pigeons to get superstition. So what was the experiment? So what Skinner did is he put pigeons in a big cage and he starved them. He waited, he didn't give them food until the pigeons lost 25% of their body. At that point, if, if, if someone doesn't give you food until you lose 25% of your body weight, you're very hungry and you're trying to do something about it. So the, the, the pigeons, each pigeon tries something else. I mean, one pigeon is trying to peck at the corner. Another pigeon is trying to look at the sky. Maybe some relief will come from there. Another pigeon thinks that maybe if it will dance around, uh, it will help. Another pigeon consults their friend. Then, at a random point in time, he sprays grains in the kitchen. And he repeats this process. So, every time you wait until the pigeons are hungry, and at a random point in time, you spray grains. Now, what is happening to the pigeon? So, a pigeon on the first spraying of bread, say a pigeon was just pecking at the corner. And suddenly it got food. So, the pigeon thinks, oh, maybe. It's related. So next time the pigeon is hungry, it's more likely to go and peck in the corner. And the pigeon that was looking at the sky, next time it is hungry, it is more likely to look at the sky because he remembers. Last time I looked at the sky, there was rain coming. And so after he repeats this experiment for like 20 or 30 times, every pigeon is completely obsessed with one activity. <laughs> Each of them is completely convinced that this activity is what brings rain. And indeed, it does. If you just peck in the corner long enough, grain will come. So, this is superstition, of course, and this is also something that the pigeons learn. So, we see here two types of animals. We see the rats that learn something very useful, and we see the pigeons that learn something very stupid, and we want to understand what makes the difference here, so maybe we can learn the lesson and not repeat these mistakes when we are trying to learn. So what is the difference between those two types of, of, uh, of learning? In what way are the rats smarter than the pigeons? So there was this guy, Garcia, in 89. So it was a long time after this phenomena was discovered. But the guy was, he was kind of, he came out of the uh, army as a pilot and decided at the age of 40 something to go study. So he had a fresh view, very different than the people in the academia before him, and he said, what happens if I replace the stimulus with the rats, I replace the, some, the taste or smell of the uh, bait that was a clue for the pigeons, I replace it by a different. So I, I, I will give them poisonous food that looks completely similar and smells completely similar and tastes completely similar to the food that they are getting every day. But of course, if I don't give them any sign, it's not a fair game. I'm just killing them. But we want to do, play a fair game. 
So anytime they're trying to ex access the to taste, the poisonous food, we will ring a bell. So now we are repeating the same experiment. We have the bait. The baits are poisonous, but they don't look different than, they don't look or smell or taste different than the usual food. But there is a warning. Every time the, the rat tries to taste the bad uh, food, there is a bell ringing. So now is my question to you. What do you think? How well will the rats pick the relationship between the sickness and the sound? Will the rats the next day, when it comes to a bay, say they didn't, they were not killed the first day, when they come to a bay, they hear the bell, they will not taste it. I mean, they felt sick at the end of the day. The sickness really was caused by the food that they ate when the bell was ringing. There is the next day, they try to eat food, and we ring the bell when they get close to a poisonous bed. So what do you think? Anybody there? Yes, what do you think? Right. So, so that is, yes. Yes. No, no, no. Only when they try to eat poison. And, and she's right. They don't pick it. And it's not only, you know, when I'm telling this story, some people tell me, oh, the, the rats, they don't have good hearing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, it was tried with other things. It was like, like with this flash of light. Whenever they try to eat the poisonous food, you just flash light into their eyes. Or with an with electric shock. Whenever they get close to the... They get an electric shock. Nothing. They don't learn it. And... Somehow, they are geared to know in advance that taste and smell and looks of the food may be related to whether it's poisonous or not, but the flash of light does not usually, in nature, indicate that food is not good. So, the rats fail to detect it, they no longer refrain from eating the poisonous food, so... What about improved rates? Why aren't there rates that will all, what can we design, just, you know, help nature a little, design improved rates that will also be sensitive to sound and smell, and not smell, they're already sensitive, but sound and electric shock and flash of light. What will happen if we imagine for a second that we have this improved rates that pays attention to many, many other things? Yes. Why? So, right. So let me phrase it in, in my own words. I think you have the right idea. And the point is that in that case, if you make them too sensitive, then every tasting of food will be an outlier in some respect. I mean, if you, if, if you uh, feel sick at the end of the day and you're trying to think what caused, so you will try to think maybe I ate in this day, I ate in some restaurant that I never ate before. But you will not associate it with this morning, oh, this morning I ate breakfast at 10 past 8, and usually I eat my breakfast at quarter past 8, maybe this is the reason I'm feeling sick. Or um, today when I ate lunch, it got cloudy outside, and usually when I eat lunch, it's shiny outside. Maybe that's the reason I got sick. If we put into the soup of our uh, stimulus too many components, then suddenly when I come to the end of the day and I feel sick, and I'm trying to think what was special, which, okay, which event was an outlier during the day, every event will be an outlier. Because if I count too many uh, parameters, then nothing repeats twice, right? So we cannot solve the problem of the rat by giving them sensitivity to more and more and more, uh, paying attention to more and more and more phenomena. So the point is that uh, there is a basic idea here, and the basic idea is called no free lunch, and it has nothing to do with eating baits, and it says that no learning is possible without apply, applying prior knowledge. And here, the prior knowledge for the rats was the knowledge that smell and taste are relevant, and that's what you should pay attention to. 
but other things are not relevant because if you pay attention to too many things, you are getting completely confused. Yes, you have the question. Right, right. I mean, uh, th that's a very good question. I mean, the, the connection. Yeah, so the question was, if it's not related to how many times do I repeat the experiment? Everybody, I mean, I think many of you heard, for example, about the Pavlov dogs. That the, the, these dogs were hearing a bell each time just before feeding, and eventually they got the association between the ringing of the bell and the feeding. And, and uh, yeah, and, and there are many other cases. And so, we, of course, animals can learn associations, but here we are talking about learning from one time experiment, from just one time experiment. And the rest do learn from just a single experiment when it has to do with taste, and they cannot learn from a single experiment when it has to do with the taste. But that's a very good point. So what I'm saying is that we see that the prior knowledge plays a crucial role. The, the pigeons did not use any prior knowledge when they tried to learn what causes the pain. The rats did use prior knowledge. Maybe this prior knowledge was accumulated over generations of the natural selection and so on but they did use prior knowledge. And the claim is no learning is possible without applying prior knowledge. And later, today we will talk about, we will we'll show a, a mathematical proof that indeed no learning is possible without applying prior knowledge. Yes. No, I mean, it, with, uh, by learning I mean successful. That you learn something which is useful. And I'm saying to do successful learning, we'll give a mathematical definition later. To do successful learning, you cannot circumvent the need for final. So we will phrase and prove this precisely later. Okay, so let's go back to our, to our problem. Our problem, remember, we had a sample, we have labels on the sample, we try to do empirical risk minimization, and we saw that it may fail badly if you just repeat what you saw and predict zero everywhere else. So now we want to introduce some prior knowledge. And the way we're going, the, the simplest way, the first way we're going to introduce some prior knowledge is by a notion of a hypothesis class. So what is a hypothesis class? A hypothesis class is a free, uh, prescribed set H of hypotheses. So you fix in advance a collection of potential hypotheses, and now you only consider hypotheses in this class. And now there is a revised version of the empirical risk minimization rule. Empirical risk minimization with respect to a prescribed class H. When you get a sample S, you pick a classifier H in the class that you fixed before that minimizes the empirical loss. So in, in a contrast with what we did before, we, before I allowed you any rule. You saw the sample, you could come up with any rule that minimizes error over the sample, you come up with very uh, rules that are useless, which are overfit. Here, you're only allowed to pick an H from this class, and this class was picked ahead of time, and this is some way of conveying prior knowledge. A prior knowledge is like the rest. They're saying, I'm only looking at hypotheses that associate my sickness with the taste or the smell of the food. I'm not allowing all possible hypotheses. So this is called ERM with respect to a class. It, it utilizes some prior knowledge, and now we can show that it does a better job. Okay, so is the, the rule clear? So now we can show the first ERM, and this is guaranteed success for ERM when we restrict it to a fixed class. So if you have, and, and the, the, the first result is very basic, we say, let's assume that you restrict your attention to a finite class H. So if H is just a finite collection of potential hypotheses, then we can make sure that now we take two precision parameters. And what we want is to make sure that this rule doesn't make error above epsilon. So we can give you a number and say that if you, your sample size is big enough, if your sample size is bigger than the log of the number of hypotheses in H plus some parameter delta, divided by epsilon, then with high probability over the choice of the sample, this rule will do a very good job. 
this rule is not going to make an error which is above epsilon. Okay, so, I mean, there are lots of parameters here, and it's a bit confusing, but let's try to read it again because it's an important uh, type of statement. This is the type of statement we are going to make. So we have here two parameters. One of them is how big the error that we are allowing, and the other parameter is what is the likelihood that we will make a bigger error. What is the risk of making a, of failing? So failure is if we make an error which is bigger than epsilon, and delta is a small probability that it will actually happen. And probability over what is probability over the samples that we see for training? If I'm trying to train you what is a spam email and what is not, maybe the sample that you got was a very bad sample, very atypical. But those samples are going to be rare. So here we get a guarantee for most of the sample, for one minus delta over the choice of samples, if you use ERM with respect to a class H and the class is finite, and the sample is bigger than the log of the size of the set, your error will be below it. It's okay? Can we go into a proof? I mean, I, I let, let me say something about, about the, the proof here. So in order to do this proof, we just use two very, very basic tools from probability theory. And the first is the that the probability of an end of two independent events is the product of that probability. So that's, I think, a, very, a rule that everybody has seen. If you have two independent events in probability, the probability that you have this and that is the product of the two. Sometimes it is used as a definition of independence. And the second rule that we are going to use is also a very simple basic rule of probability, and that's the union bound. The union bound states that if you have the probability of an O of two events, is almost is always, at most, the sum of the probability. Okay? So these are the two basic rules that we're going to use. With these two basic rules, we can already uh, prove our... our uh, and then let me just sketch on the board. I, all the proofs I, I wanted to... I prefer to do on the board than to do them on the slide. So let me just sketch the, the proof. So the idea is... So what we want to show is that every hypothesis H that has small error is not likely to come up in this rule. So we are using this rule ERM H over the sample, which means we are going to pick an H that behaves as good as possible over the sample among all the H's. Right? So now I want to show you that it's unlikely that you will pick a bad H. So what is a bad, what is a bad H? A bad H, if this is the space of all the possible X's, so this is our main space, and for every H I can draw, so if I have an H, I can draw here is where H has success, and here is where H fails. So here H predicts correctly, and here H disagrees with my function F. So here F is different than H, and here H agrees with F. Okay? So what is a bad hypothesis? A bad hypothesis is a hypothesis that has probability of more than epsilon to disagree with the true label. So for a bad hypothesis, this area has weight, the probability of this area, probability of fail, is greater than epsilon. This is a bad hypothesis. Now I want to show that it's unlikely that we'll find a bad hypothesis. So the point is that we get the sample, and the sample consists of points x1 up to xm that were picked independently of h1. So what is the probability? Now look, look at what is happening. If I see the sample, and if I see a point here, if I get in the sample a point here, this point I will see on the training sample that my H is not predicting correct. So if I get a point here, I am not going to pick this H. So if I pick this H, it is only if I didn't see any point that indicates that it's a bad hypothesis. See, I'm seeing those X1, Y1, up to XM, XM, YM, and I'm trying to fit an H that behaves as good as possible. If there is an H that behaves perfectly, I mean, if I know that there is, then whenever I see one mistake, I will dis, 
regard this H. So if H passes, it means that none of the examples fail here. So what is the probability that the first assumption, that the first point will not be in, in this area? What is the probability that my first point X1 will not be in the area that indicates that my H is bad? What? 1 minus epsilon, right? At least 1 minus epsilon. That's the probability that the first point will not show me that I'm doing bad. What is the probability the second point will not show me? It's again 1 minus epsilon. And I assume that those points are independent of each other. So if I take a sample of size M, the probability that none of them will show me that I'm playing with a bad H is 1 over epsilon to the power M. So the probability that I'll pick an H, which is bad, just by this rule that each Xi is independent. That was our assumption. Every sample is independent. The probability that all of them are going to miss the warning is a, all of them are going to miss the warning. The probability is less than 1 over a minus 1 to the epsilon. And 1 minus 1 to the epsilon, we know that it's less than epsilon to the minus than e to the minus epsilon m. So we have a very small probability of failure. And that is what shows us that for a given h, the probability of failure over a big sample is very small. Probability of failure, or the probability that we we'll misconsider this h as being good when it's a bad h is very small. That's for a single h. Now what is the probability if I have a finite set of hypotheses? So if now I'm drawing a different picture, this is all samples. So I know that for H1, that there's a very small area, exponentially small, of samples that will mislead the first echo. And then there is the first very small area that will mislead the second echo. And so on, for every hypothesis, there are some samples that will mislead it. These are all the samples that don't show me that this hypothesis is bad. But what, my, what is my probability that there exists a hypothesis that was misled? So now I'm using a union bound. Probability that there exists a bad hypothesis that was not detected by the sample is at most the sum of all of these. So we get that the probability of ERM H over S is the probability when you pick S that this guy fails fails means a mistake bigger than epsilon, is at most the size of H, because we take this one, this probability plus this probability plus this probability, times E to the minus M epsilon. So now we get this probability is very small, and if you want this to be smaller than delta, we get, we want this to be smaller than delta, we get that M if m is bigger than a uh, log h plus log 1 over delta divided by epsilon, we can guarantee that with probability greater than 1 minus delta, we will not make an error. So I'm, I'm not expecting you to follow the full argument and now go and, and write it yourself. But just see that what I'm using here are very, very basic, just two principles that the points are independent of each other, that independent event, the probability is the product of each of the events, and then the union bound. If I have only finitely many hypotheses, the probability that at least one of them will fail is at most the sum of the probabilities for each of them to fail. And if I combine these two principles, I get this bound that tells me if the sample is big enough, I have a good guarantee that I'm not, that LMH is not going to make a big error. Yes. Oh, what I'm saying is I want to, this is the probability, this is an upper bound of the probability of that I'm making a bad um, choice, right? So if I want this upper bound to be less than delta, then I can now manipulate and get it. This is an upper bound on my, on my failure. I want it to be less than delta. Now I just, uh, take M out, and I get from it. Yes. Right. Just the number of, of hypothesis H. We will later talk about the structure. That's a good point. 
So what he was saying is that we did not use here anything about the structure of H. We just counted how many hypotheses there are. Later, we will see that the structure of H can really help us get better results. Any more ask, uh, questions, comments? Okay, so let, let's, let's move on. So we had our first result. Our first result is that if we do ERM carefully, not ERM in general, but ERM restricted to an H, and this H is finite, then we can get a bound on our success. Okay, so now let's... Okay, and it turns out that we can get success not only for finite classes, but also for infinite classes. So here, I, I, my success was based on the assumption that I have in advance a finite class, and I know that the labeling rule is consistent with one of the finite members of my class. It's a very favorable situation, then I can succeed. But I'm saying that we can succeed also for infinite classes. We'll see it in the lecture in the afternoon. I will not get into the proof here, but it does not necessarily have to do with the class being finite. Although the proof that I used here took advantage of the finite. Okay, so let, let us just formalize it. So we have this notion of a class being pack learnable. So a class is being pack learnable. The class is kind of my prior knowledge. And the class is being pack uh, learnable if, so this is a, a, a very central definition, so it's, it's worth paying attention. So PAC stands for probably approximately correct. At the beginning, it sounds like a very weak requirement. I'm telling you I'm going to be probably approximately correct. But it is a, a, a strong, a very strong requirement. Okay, so what is, when do I say that the class is probably approximately correct? The, if there is a function, so this function depends only on H, this function takes two parameters and gives me a number. What is the function, uh, what is the meaning of this function? That there is a learning algorithm that it, for every precision and confidence parameters, epsilon and delta, so these two parameters are going to be the two parameters here, I can calculate a number, mh, how many examples will I need in order to get this precision with this confidence? And if my sample size is above this, then no matter what the probability distribution is, my probability of error will be at most delta. Okay, so what I'm saying here is I want a guarantee that will not depend on which distribution. I don't know what distribution is going to generate emails. So I want to tell you, if you want to have confidence that you're not going to miss spam more than 1% of the time, and you want to have a confidence that you get this result with high probability. So you train on some sample with high probability over this sample, you are really going to get a spam filter that makes error not more than 1%. Then I can give you a number which is independent of how data is generated. And if you have such a number of examples, you have the guarantee that you want. So this is the, the, the basic notion of uh, pack learnability. This was the notion proposed by Valiant in 1984. And this is really gave a big boost to our ability to analyze learning situations. Yes. L. Oh, oh okay. The, L is the loss and this is the, the arrow. This is the arrow with respect to the true distribution of the algorithm applied to the sample. Okay, so I, I will talk about this later. So for now, our loss, our error, is the number of mistakes made, probability of making mistakes later. We'll talk about other possible notions of that. That's why I'm using L here and not error. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, so this again, this is the probability that on a new email, you will predict incorrectly. So this is the probability under the distribution that we don't know, the generate emails, that on a new email you will predict a uh, mispredict. Mis okay? Okay, so let me just, yes. If 
if you have mislabeled it. Okay, right. Right, so the equation the, that it's truly from, okay, so that's a good point. We assume here, so what we assume, we, we have make here two strong assumptions that are kind of hidden, but let me uh, point out what are these strong assumptions. The first strong assumption is that my data is labeled by some labeling rule which is in H. So you have a class H that you define in advance. You don't know which of them is the true labeling rule, but the true labeling rule belongs to H. That's a very strong assumption. And now the other strong assumption is that the way the data is generated. So we assume that there is an unknown distribution that picks emails. But we assume that the emails are picked independently of each other, and the sample was picked by the same process and labeled by the same function. So there are no mislabelings over the sample that I use for training. And under those assumptions, I can give you a guarantee that for big enough samples, you will have this low probability of error. Okay? So this is just a definition. It tells you when is the class back learning. When can we do probably approximately correct? So a probably applies to the delta. Our probability of success is above 1 minus delta. And approximately correct applies to the epsilon. All we need is not a perfect predictor, but an approximate predictor that will not make error more than epsilon part of the time. Okay, so that's our definition of probably approximately correct. And it's already a, a strong requirement because it is independent of this unknown. And what we can see here the a first point in which machine learning, modern machine learning, deviates from classical statistics. In classical statistics, you usually make assumptions about how the data is generated. We analyze a lot normal distributions, Gaussian distributions, Poisson distributions. If the distribution is such, then you can say a lot about what you can find. Here, I don't make any assumption about the distribution. It could be arbitrary distribution, still will have the same bound regardless of what the distribution is. Okay, so what we did see is that finite classes, we proved that finite classes are pack learnable, and I claimed without proof that there are also infinite classes which are pack learnable. But we use these strong assumptions that the labeling rule was from H, and that the data was uh, labeled, picked independently and labeled correct, the training. Okay, so that's our first stop. That was the, this was what uh, Valiant got in, in 84, which was uh, the first step that's saying we can get such a uh, result. But of course, there is something here which is very uh, artificial and very demanding, and this is that the function belongs to the class. So you have in advance a finite class of a process, and someone guarantees to you that the rule by which emails are de uh, determined, spam or not, comes from this class. So we want to relax it. So we want to make it a little bit more realistic. And, and the whole success of machine learning really started when we moved from this very artificial situation to more realistic scenarios. So the more realistic is we want to relax the realizability assumption wish to model scenarios in which the learner does not have this prior knowledge of a class to which the true rule belongs. That was a very strong question. Furthermore, we even want to allow situations in which the labeling rule is not deterministic. What I mean by labeling rule is not deterministic. Maybe what I'm measuring from the email is not enough to determine whether it's spam or not. Maybe I, I don't have enough parameters in the data to know whether it's spam or not. So in that case, we can say the labeling rule is not uh, deterministic. If the data contains the word sex and a million dollars, then with very high probability it's spam, but I'm not completely sure. So we want to relax these assumptions and, and get results that will be relevant to more realistic situations. And we also want to generalize our loss. So the loss so far, what we the loss that we suffered was counting how many mistakes we made. But the same scenario can apply to a much wider set of uh, circumstances. So here we define a notion of a general loss. So what is a general loss? A general loss, we can think of the general problem, a little, uh, learning problem a little bit more generally. What is a general learning problem? I have a class of models that are trying to explain the world, and I have phenomena that I draw from the world. And I have a notion of loss that tells me 
the loss takes a, a model and takes a point and tells me how bad is this model when I look at this point. So in the previous case, I had a model which was a predictor of spam or not, and I looked at a specific email and I said, oh, it's really bad if I made a mistake and it's perfect if I didn't make it. But they say we can do it more generally. We have a notion of loss. It measures the fitness of the model to a point. And then we want to optimize the loss with respect to a distribution. So what we want to optimize is the expected loss when the point is picked from the unknown distribution. So the step I made here is I replaced the loss that was saying just mistake or no mistake with a general notion of loss. And the general notion of loss gives me a score of how good is the model for this point, and I want to optimize the expected score. Now, this situation can really reflect many more realistic scenarios. So first of all, what we saw so far was the zero one loss. The zero one loss was when I have a hypothesis and I have a point with the label, I am, I am saying I got zero loss if HX was correct, and I got one loss if I mispredict. That was what we saw before. But here are more scenarios in which we can talk about uh, losses, more general losses. For example, the, the square loss. So the square loss is, say my model is a real valued function. I'm trying to predict the temperature tomorrow at noon. And then I see the true temperature tomorrow at noon. So what is going to be my loss? I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you, you failed any time the temperature that you predicted is not exactly 23.3 degrees, which what I'm going to charge you is the difference between your prediction and the true temperature square. So this is a different notion of loss, and this is the square loss, when we can use the same t tools to handle such loss. Another type of uh, scenario that we can model with general loss is the k-means clustering. So what is the k-means clustering? So the k-means clustering, anybody here knows something about clustering? Who heard the terms k-means clustering most of the things? So the, the k-means clustering is, I mean, say that I, I, I want to, uh, to build a, a pizza sh a chain, and I want to know where to place my pizza shops. And I want to minimize the distance between a shop to a customer. So what I want to do is to place my centers. These are my shops that are going to sell pizzas. And Z is a customer. And what I'm paying for every customer, I'm paying the distance of this customer to the closest center. So it's the minimum of all my centers of the distance between the customer and the center. So the quality of the placement of my shops is when, when a given customer comes, it is how far it is from this given customer. And what I want to optimize is the expectation of this slot, the expectation of a distance of the customer from the closest shop. So what I'm saying is once we allow this general loss, we can model many more situations to just a uh, spam predict. We can do many more. And most of the, of the discussion from now on will be relevant to those general loss. Okay, so we have this general notion of loss and we want to relax the assumption uh, that we had before that the function came from our class. So now we have this new definition. So the new definition came about 10 years after the original definition of PAC, people realize it's not realistic, we need something more relaxed, and this is the notion of agnostic PAC parameter. So let's look at this new definition. We say that H is agnostically PAC learnable if there is, it's a function as before that takes parameters epsilon, delta, and tells you how many examples you need, but now there is no labeling rule F. Now we have just a probability distribution over points and labels. So I have some probability of seeing an email that looks like this and is a spam, and I have a some probability of seeing an email with the same feature which is not spam. So I have a probability over emails and labels. And now my notion of success is saying if I see a sample which is big enough for those confidence and uh, precision parameters, then look at what is happening here. Before, I required that the probability that I'll make an error will be 
uh, make an arrow bigger than epsilon is less than delta, this is, this is a mistake. This should be bigger than say, This is reversed. So the probability that my loss will be bigger than, now not just bigger than epsilon, but bigger than the loss of the best guy in H plus epsilon. So I made two changes. I threw away the assumption that F belongs to the class. And in return, what I'm saying is instead of the guarantee that I had before, if you look at the guarantee before, uh, if we look back at the guarantee of the, where were we in the definition of class? Okay. So you see, here I had the probability that I'll make an arrow bigger than epsilon is small. Now I replace it by well, well they go too far. Okay. Now I replace it by the probability that I make an arrow not big. This should be reversed. Probability that I make an arrow bigger than not just epsilon, but the infimum of all H's in H of the arrow of H. So what I'm doing now is kind of philosophical change. Before, we made a very strong assumption. We required absolute success. You'll make error less than epsilon, but you made a very strong assumption. You have a class F, H, that one of them is the true label. Now we replace the strong assumption by a weaker relative guarantee. The relative guarantee is just a guarantee that you will not do much worse than the best in the class. And with the relative guarantee, the guarantee will always hold. Let me, let me may, maybe explain with another example. Assume that I want you to convince you I'm a stock uh, broker, and I want to convince you, give me your money and I'll invest it for you. So the previous guarantee looked like saying, unless something unexpected is happening in the world markets, I guarantee to you that you will gain 2% every year. So now you give me your money, but if something unexpected happens, I don't owe you anything. I only made the commitment under a strong assumption. The second type, the relative guarantee, is I'm telling you, you know, here is this big investment company, and I have more, many, many experts inside there. I guarantee to you that no matter what happens in the world, I will not do worse than the best guy in this company. So maybe there is a collapse of markets, and I'm losing your money, but they are losing it too, so you can't blame me. So what we did here is we replaced the guarantee that was based on a strong assumption with a guarantee that always holds, but it's a relative guarantee. It's relative, I'm only guaranteeing, this again should be the other direction, I'm only guaranteeing compared to the best in H. So now I'm using my class H not as an assumption, but I'm using my class H as a benchmark. I'm going to behave better than anybody in H. And I get a guarantee that always holds. That's diagnostic part, and that's a much more realistic situation for learning because we cannot make assumptions about the world. Okay, so, yes. Right, no, we fix the loss in advance. We, the rules of the game is that we fix the notion of a loss and you fix the class H of who you want to compete with. All of them. Okay, so this is a special situation. I will not discuss it now, but the, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so this, uh, I, I keep saying, I, I made a mistake here with the other region. Oh, right. Right, so, all, okay, so let me, right, let, let me explain this. What is this probability over? The probability is over the sample. The samples are generated randomly. I don't know whether I'm going to get a good sample that tells me about the world or a very atypical sample. So the probability over the sample and now I feed the sample into my algorithm and I check which loss did I get. And I want to say the algorithm is going to, with high probability over the sample, the algorithm is going to behave well. What does it mean to behave well? 
its error will not be worse than the best in H plus it. Okay? So the probability is over the generation of sum. Right. Okay, again. Yeah, yeah, let's see what you put. The, his pro the problem is that here I have already expected loss, L. And why do I need a probability of expected loss? But note that this expected loss depends on the sample that you fed it. I plug the S in it. So some S's will give me, I plug S in it, I got a, a predictor, this predictor has expected loss. I plug a different S, I will get a different S. The, this probability is from the P from above from drawing M independent sample point. It's always the same thing. So more precisely, I should have written it as the, instead of this probability, what I, for the people, can I, oh no, I cannot write on this. <laughs> so, yeah, for, for, let me rewrite this for uh, the people who care about precision here. It is the probability when the sample is picked from M copies of P. So I have a distribution P that picks points X, Y, and I pick independently M points. So it's probability of a sample picked in this way that now when I have this sample, I feed it to my algorithm A, it spits an assumption, so I can ask what is the expected loss of the hypothesis that A spit out when it gets, when it got there. And I wonder the probability that this guy, how to erase. Oh. I wonder the probability of this guy being bigger than the best, so it's the minimum of all H's in H of the loss with respect to this P of H plus epsilon, this is a bad event. My predictor failed in the competition. It had a bigger error than the best guy in H, in capital H. This I want to be small. Okay? So my notion of failure is a relative notion of failure. It's compared to the best in H. The probability is over the samples, and this is what my algorithm gave. Okay, does it make sense now? Yes. The expectation here is the algorithm was fed with an S, and now what I get here is some hypothesis H. And for this hypothesis, I ask what is the expected loss of this hypothesis? So this is the notion of agnostic path learnability, and this is a very uh, reasonable, in terms of, from the point of view of practice, it's a very practical, uh, okay, it's a very practical uh, notion of learnability. Any more questions here? Right, so here I'm saying if there exists an algorithm, so a classy learnable, if there exists a good algorithm, anywhere in the world, you can try to find me an algorithm, I'll tell you the class is learnable. So I'm giving you the possibility of picking an algorithm from everywhere. It's a property of the class. Right, if I define it relative to a fixed class of algorithms, it will be more demanding, it will be diff more difficult to learn because I restrict your algorithm. Here I didn't restrict the algorithm. Okay? Yes. Right, that's a very good question. What I, I was complaining about the previous version, yes, the question, I'll repeat the question. The, the, he asks, I mean, I was complaining 
<laughs> yeah, well, I was about to repeat the question. I, I was complaining that the assumption is not realistic. The assumption that the function comes from the class is not realistic. So what he's suggesting is make it realistic by allowing all possible functions. Then the assumption it becomes much more realistic. Now, although it doesn't cover the case of probabilistic labeling, it will cover any deterministic label. We will see in a second that this is not possible. In a second means, yeah, in a second. If I allow all functions, and I will assume that the phenomena is deterministic, then this infimum will be zero. Right. Any other questions? Okay, so this is really a, an important notion and worthwhile to, to uh, worry about it, but uh, you, you will have the recording and you have the book, so we, we, you can go back to it. Okay, so we said that this is a relative notion of guarantee, and for this weakening of getting a relative notion, we could get rid of making strong assumptions. Now we make no assumptions about how the data is generated, except that it was generated independently. Every example was independent of Okay, um, oh, I, I went in the wrong direction. Okay, so now the question is, how are we going to learn? What algorithms can handle this difficult task of agnostic learning? Agnostic learning is a more difficult task. What algorithms are we going to use? So we are going to use a very similar algorithm, and we talked about it. We, before, we talked about the empirical loss. Now I can repeat the same definition and talk about the empirical loss in the case of a generic, a general notion of loss. So the empirical loss with respect to a sample S is just the average loss over all members of S. So you see, now I don't have X and Y. I put them together into a Z. For every Z, I see how well my H behaves, and I take the average over the sample, and that's my empirical loss. And I can still repeat with this notion of empirical loss, I can repeat the um, notion of empirical loss minimization. So now the question is, when will it work well? I want to give you a condition under which it is going, empirical loss minimization is going to behave well. So now we're coming to a very important notion, which is a notion of a representative sample. So I say that the sample S is rep epsilon representative of a class H, with respect to distribution P, if for every H in H, the loss, the empirical loss that I calculate in H is close to the true loss. Okay, so if you still have some <laughs> focus left, look at this definition. It's a very natural and nice definition. It says, what is a representative sample? A representative sample for a class H, it says that for every element in H, if I estimate evaluate how good it is with respect to the sample, it will be close to how truly good it is. So a representative sample is a kind of a reliable sample. Every member of H, I can estimate on the sample and get a good enough answer. So that's a notion of an epsilon representative sample for a class H because it just has to be correct for H as in H. It's epsilon representative with respect to distribution P. That is going to be a very useful notion. The sample gives me reliable information. Yes. Right, so the question is, can I get representative samples? Very good. In the real world, this might not be true. The question is, can I get representative samples? So what I'm going to do next is, first of all, make the argument that if you did get representative samples, then your learning will succeed. And then we're going to analyze how likely we are to get representative samples. So these are going to be our steps towards showing that we can learn in the demanding agnostic set. Okay? So we'll show that if you got representative samples, then you're lucky and everything is fine. And then we will analyze when are you likely to get such nice samples. So here is the next slide, the, the connection between representative samples and ERM. If S is epsilon representative, with respect to the class, then if we do ERM with respect to this S, we are guaranteed that our hypothesis will be pretty good. 
So again, what is this claiming? If S was a very nice sample, if S was epsilon representative, and now I output a hypothesis that minimizes the error with respect to S, then I have a guarantee that the true error of my hypothesis is, at, uh, uh, is no bigger than the best in the class plus two epsilon. Uh, uh, the proof is very simple and I will not go into the proof, but uh, the intuition should be clear. If the sample is representative and I optimize over the sample, then I'm doing as best as possible over the class. Because for every age in the class, my estimate using the sample is a reliable estimate. So it tells me that if I was lucky enough to get representative samples, then ERM with respect to such samples will do a good job. Okay, is it clear now, this one? Okay, so now we are coming to the question of how likely we are to get representative samples. If we have representative samples, we can learn with a very simple ERM algorithm how likely are we to get representative samples. So that's what we are going to discuss next. And this is, we, do, we phrase it as a property of the class. So we said that the class has uniform convergence property. You see, now I'm not talking about the class being learnable. I'm just talking about a purely statistical property of the class. The class has the uniform convergence property if there is a function, as before, such that for every distribution over the domain and every epsilon and delta, if my sample size is bigger than the requirement of this function, then I will, with high probability, bigger than one minus delta, my sample will be represented. So, again, what is a uniform convergence property class? It's a nice class. It's a class in which I have a guarantee. If you give me so many samples, most of them will be representative. Notice that the bigger the sample, the most, more likely it is to be represented. The bigger the sample, the more it reflects the distribution. So let, let's maybe again, I, I will, because this is a kind of important definition, let me again back it with a, a drawing. So say, where is my pen? Say that my class is, say that my class is the class of, uh, say, rectangle. So what is a representative sample? A representative sample of a distribution means that if this is my distribution, say this is the shape of my distribution, a representative sample is such that for every rectangle that I get, the proportion of points in the sample that I'll see is close to the weight of this uh, distribution. So, a representative sample should be such that if here I get 20% of a the distribution, then 20% of my sample, say my sample had 10 points, if this rectangle captured 20% of the distribution, then 20% of my red points are going to be in this rectangle. And the same will hold for every rectangle. So for every rectangle, the proportion of points for my sample that the rectangle captures will reflect reliably the weight of this rectangle with respect to this. So that means that my red sample is a representative. And I say that a class has this uniform convergence property if you can guarantee that if you take samples which are big enough, most of them will be represented. What we already know is that if a class has this property, it will be agnostically path learnable because if I generate representative samples and I use ERM, there will be successful uh, hypothesis. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the sample, right. What I'm missing here, is, this is a good point, but what I'm missing is the samples, what I mean by sample is IID sampling from P. So always my sample S is, S is generated, oh. <laughs> I mean, the main thing is that who didn't see it, so. <laughs> the sample is generated from P to the end. 
from M copies of T. Okay, now I'm afraid to take it down. <laughs> <laughs> Can you look another direction? <laughs> Okay, so let, let's see what we can still do in the next uh, remaining 10 minutes. Okay, so we have this notion of uniform convergence property and the corollary is if the class has the uniform convergence property, then it is agnostic path learner. If it has this nice property that samples become eventually representative, we can learn it. Okay, and now the question is, we want to prove now that some classes have this property. So I think I put the proof in before I put theorem. Where is the theorem here? So the proof came before the theorem. So let's first look. If H is finite, then it has the uniform convergence property. So the corollary will be that for finite H's, not only they are pack learnable in the demanding sense, in the assumption sense, but they're also agnostic pack learning in the, most real, in the more realistic sense. So if I have a finite H, it is agnostic. It has the uniform convergence property, and therefore every finite H is agnostically path learnable. And in order to show that, to, to prove it, I, I don't think I will get into a, the proof now, but for the proof, I will use the Hofting uh, inequality for the uniform convergence of a single H, and then the union bound to handle the class. So I want, in order to show you, I want to show that if the class is finite, it has a uniform convergence property. So the first step is to say, if I have a single H, I can guarantee that if I take a big enough sample, the proportion of hitting this H is reflective of the distribution hitting this H. If I only have one rectangle, then I have a bound, which is called the Hofding bound, that tells me that no matter what the distribution is, if I take a big enough sample, the proportion of points that will hit my rectangle reflects the true weight of this rectangle in the distribution. That's the Hofting inequality tells me. And now if the class is finite, I can use the union bound in the same way that we used it before and get the result that finite classes have the uniform convergence property and therefore finite classes are agnostic factors. Before we saw that they are learnable under the strong assumption and now we are showing that they are learnable under the weak, the stronger requirement, weaker assumption. We don't make any assumption, they are still learnable in the agnostic. And so the corollary is that finite classes are agnostic pack learnable. And that ERN suffices for. Okay, so the last thing I want to discuss in, in the remaining 10 minutes is really the question that I was asked there. Do I really need, you see, what we get here, what we get here is a, a guarantee that saying my arrow is bounded by the best arrow in H plus epsilon. So if I take a very big H, then the best arrow in H is going to be small. If I increase H, I drive down this infinite. So maybe the best thing to do is why restrict to H at all? Maybe I can find a universal learner that will give me such a guarantee with respect to the class of all possible functions. That will be perfect. I will be able to compete with everybody. And the way I say it, you already guessed the answer. So what is going to be the answer? The answer is that this is not possible and this is our no free lunch theorem that I promised you, but this is a precise definition. Okay, so what is the precise definition? So what I'm going to show you is that you must restrict your class H that you're competing with. You cannot compete simultaneously with the whole world with every possible function. So what are we saying here? Let A be any learning algorithm. So you pick your favorite learning algorithm. You are a believer in deep learning, so pick your very deep learning algorithm. And and you have some set X. If your sample size is less than half of X. So you see, one way of learning is saying, I will wait until I will see all the possible emails in the world and I will memorize everything. And now I know how to do spam detection because I saw everything. So I know which is spam and which is not. But that I wouldn't call it 
learning, I will call it memorizing. If you want to learn, I want you to at least be able to settle for less than half the points of the world, of the universe. So if M is less than half of the universe, then you pick your algorithm. For such a sample size, there is a distribution and the labeling rule, such that this labeling rule makes zero error, but your algorithm fails with probability at least one over seven, it is error is bad is worse than one over eight. Okay, so let, let's read this theorem again. The theorem tells the following. You pick your favorite algorithm. I give you a restriction. You are not allowed to see more than half of the points in the universe. With this restriction, no matter which algorithm you picked, you're going to make, there, there is going to be a distribution that will mislead you. There is going to be a distribution such that this distribution is learnable, but not by your algorithm. Your algorithm is going for a big proportion of the time, it's going to make a significant error. So it kind of says, if we define learning as being able to draw conclusions with seeing less than half the universe, if that's our definition of learning, then for every learner, there is a phenomena that could be learned, but your learner missed it. But your learner is going to make with significant probability a significant error. That's the no free lunch theorem. Yeah. Right, this is for the zero one loss. That's a good point. This is for the z only for the zero one loss. The this numbers and this phrasing at a very good point is for the zero one loss. Because, I mean, here's a very good point. If I define my loss to be zero always, then I have a very good learner. No matter the, what the learner does, I define the loss to be zero and I'm successful. But this is for the zero one loss. It's for a discrete set X, but it means that if X is infinite, then no sample size will suffice. So that's another good point. Here it's phrased as if I take the size of X and divide by two, but it just means that if X is infinite, no sample size will suffice. So philosophically, it's a very interesting state. It tells you for every learner, there is some phenomena that could be learned, but not by this learner. Something very democratic. If you have, for every person in this room, you may be a very smart mathematician and a great violinist and the prettiest person on earth. There is some virtue that someone else has better than you. <laughs> Except for you. <laughs> so this is what we are saying here. For every algorithm, there exists some phenomena. This phenomena can be learned because if you kind of had a class that contained this F, then you could have learned it, but my algorithm is going to make it. Okay, so let's see what can we can do in three minutes. Uh, I mean, the corollary is, uh, relates to the question that we had before. So, oh, what is this? Uh, the corollary is jumping too far. So let me just conclude with some idea of the proof here, and then we will continue in the, in the afternoon. So let me just show you the idea of the proof on, on the board of this no free lunch theorem. So the idea is, is a kind of a very uh, generic argument, which says the following. We are going to draw a very big table. So we are going to draw a table where here we fix we fix our algorithm A, and we fix our domain X, and we fix the sample size M. And we assume that the sample size is less than half of the unit. We fix the unit. And now I'm going to draw a very big, uh, a very big matrix. Here I'm going to have all possible samples. So here I have S1, S2, S3, all possible samples of size M. So these are samples of size n. And here I'm going to have every possible labeling rule. So I'm going to have F1, F2, every possible labeling rule, up to F 
true to the size of X, all the possible labeling. And the idea is that, so now I have this big matrix, all possible samples and all possible labeling. And now if I pick a labeling rule and I pick a sample, what I want to put in this entry is the loss or the error of my algorithm. We fix a distribution. The distribution is going to be uniform over X. The loss of my algorithm, when I label it with F, so I pick a, a point in a random labeling with F, and I feed S with, so the sample here is SI, the function here is FJ. So what I'm putting here in this entry of the table is I say, assume my sample got this as training, and assume that this was the labeling rule, how much error am I going to make? So I have here a table of all possible labeling rules, all possible samples, and each entry tells me for my fixed algorithm, if this was the sample and this was the labeling rule, how much error it would make. And now we can see that the, the next argument is going to be that because the function, that because the sample is covering only half of the universe and the function is arbitrary, for every sample, no matter what the algorithm does over the sample, it will going to have an error of at least a quarter. So for every, if I fix a sample, no matter what my algorithm does, my algorithm, if I look at the space of all possible points, I saw only half of them. On the second half, no matter what I predicted, half the functions will say zero, half the functions will say one. So I will be making a mistake for half of the functions if the points fall here. So for half of the points, those that fall where I didn't see them in S, for half of the functions I'm going to be making mistakes. Which means that the average of every column is at least one quarter. Again, for every a column is a fixed S. Fixed S is saying what I saw is this part of the universe. And now the column is going over all possible labeling functions. So if I only saw this part of the universe, then with probability half, I will get my test point in the part that I didn't see. Since I'm considering all possible functions, half of them will be different than what I predicted. So with probability half, half of the function will make me wrong. So therefore, the average of every column is at least a quarter. But if the average of the every column is at least a quarter, it means that the average of all of this table of my errors is this quarter. And if the average of the, all of the table of my errors is at least a quarter, it means that there is a row such that in this row I'm going to make average at least a quarter. But what is the row? A row is a function, some fj, fi, over which when I take average over all possible samples, the error of my algorithm is at least a quarter. So what I showed is that there exists a function such that when I take average of all possible training samples, my algorithm will make on average error of at least a quarter. And that's what makes me, what gives me the failure of my algorithm. Okay, so for more details I, I, on this, I refer you to my book. I think I have a slide with my book here. But uh, <laughs> we will continue in the afternoon with uh, with a different uh, with some further topics, so yeah, that's the book, and uh, it's called Understanding Machine Learning, and you it's freely downloadable from the internet, so I don't even ask you to buy it. If you buy it, I get half a dollar for each book you buy, <laughs> <laughs> but it's freely downloadable from the internet. So thank you.